So I think we're running a little behind time, and I want to call up um, some very special guest speakers. So we have uh, Randy Fred, a Nuchoma person, who is willing to share his uh, experience with residential school. They're each going to take 10 minutes and give you a little overview of what life is like for them. Rose Labrador, she's a Mi'kmaq from Eastern Canada. She's going to share with you her experience. And we have some young people here who are going to talk to uh, you about their experience of being intergenerationally impacted. So I'm going to call up Patrick Alec, and he can have a seat, and Ariel Godfrey, and Wendy Dennis. Thank you. Uh, you know, I was just uh, thinking, you know, many of you have already heard my story, and I think uh, what I'd like to do is to kind of focus on on the, the child development, not really uh, uh, thinking a lot about uh, the importance of Philip Leland and Mark Young's uh, uh, fundraising campaign to, to build a child development center and I mean, what a great thing. You know, it's just such a great thing like that. That housing unit where Florence lives up on 10th. It's just a, a I mean, just the concept is so, so perfect, you know, to have elders living in the same housing unit as young people, it just makes so much sense. And it's so Indian, you know. <laughs> um, some people still get offended when I call myself an Indian. I was born in Indian, raised in Indian, and I still think of myself as an Indian. The, um, you know, the thing about uh, the Indian residential school is, um, you know, being taken away from your family, it, it just left this real uh, gap, you know, of um, belonging. Like our child development years were, were filled with uh, illness, you know, like, uh, like the male supervisors, most of them were dishonorable discharges from the RCMP or uh, from the Navy, you know, so they're homosexuals and pedophiles. And you know, these are these were our parental images, you know, so it's easy to understand how, you know, from that environment growing up becoming involved in a relationship, you know, you, you, you do what you learn, you know, so, you know, so, so that's where our family violence came from, our incest, pedophilia, you know, just all this horrible stuff. And, you know, for Tillich and Leila to, to, to build and operate, a child development center makes so much sense. And it's, and, it's, and it's just a natural cycle of bringing us back to where we should be. You know, in my opinion, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission did very little in the way of reconciliation. But, you know, it's up to us, you know, as communities, and to look at the take the lead here, in this kind of event, you know, for, for working towards reconciliation, it's just, it has to happen. And it's happening in a good way. The um, uh, need for uh, uh, public awareness is huge, and, uh, you know, to sensitize each other in our cultural ways is, is so important. So what I'm doing, you know, on my part is um, I'm involved with CM Media Society, and we 
have a website, www.cmmedia.com. And Lawrence is involved with us, and uh, we have some Halloween videos up on there right now. They're, they're just raw footage, but we're going to develop them into proper shows when we get the funding. And then with just a couple of weeks left until the end of the month, we're, we're hoping to be able to find some Indian residential school survivors who haven't used their $3,000 education plan put towards helping us with more videos. But our intent is to make Kalkamina available. People who are living a language, it's always who are fluent to, to have something to listen to. Uh, in the spring, we're going to bring in Evan Gardner to develop Where Are Your Keys? And uh, Broadband and uh, Musqueam and Swamish Nation are using this his program called Where Are Your Keys? And it combines uh, sign language with uh, language teaching. Florence and I and Francis Bob went over to Broadband to observe it and it's very, very exciting. It's a way to advance the learning of a language and have been a means of retaining that language and using that language that each student right from their first lesson they're, they're taught to work towards being a teacher of the language and that helps them further learn the language I feel better today about uh, you know being able to share my story but after, after having uh, opportunities to to, uh, to share the real nasties. And, uh, you know, it's all part of my healing journey. And, um, and it's always just so great to be in a room full of friends.
So it could take a couple years. Uh, just, I just wanted to say that um, within that hearing, I realized records can disappear. And they're saying that the priest doesn't exist, but at the same time, the government lawyer was priest lawyer. They're saying he doesn't exist. And they're trying to make these say different names. But I stuck in my truth. Was after 50 years, it was powerful. And I invite a walk with me for a while, for during this time your spirit asks about the knowing of the roads ahead, mine has walked, and your spirit begins. You are ready to know the teachings. As with my spirit, I was invited to walk the red roads with my elders. I accept it. The road is one. The choices and the challenges of the road divide. Many left and many right yet to divide again. Choice of freedom present. The challenges manifest in the quiet listening and living in a wise, honored position. <coughs> and that's for each one of us. We are honored to be alive and to have what we have with family and friends and community. I'm shaking more than I've ever shaken. <coughs> Challenge becomes the use of your mind, your body, and your spirit that's within you. And the challenges are many, and the choices are many more. Options coincide from the challenges and the choices. And finally, the challenges, the choices, and the options come down to you. Walk the road beside and with your elder. And, and you know, for somebody that's not First Nations, you know, you get your seniors, it is. Walk with your own, walk with your parents, walk with your grandfathers, walk with the children. And hear, hear the spoken and the unspoken, as we are very um, oral and we have a silent language that we all understand within our families and our communities, and what, that's what that's about. Many languages are spoken along the road. Creator is wise in the gift of language. The elders speak the words from experience. The elders speak words of experience from timelessness, wisdom, and teachings that are ancient. The elders speak the words in the smiles, in the hand gestures, and from the body, from the unspoken, and through the look. As um, many elders, when I've done something inappropriate, no matter how small, they will give me that look, and no, not really yet, they're going to stop. And the elders speak the words from a strengthening, ancient, living, and nurturing belief system. The challenges you will honor and respect. 
listen what has our talk taught you today and what has our walk taught you today and look what did our walk teach you to see. Give thanks to the Creator, Mother Earth, Father, Son, and all the ancestors, the eagle, and all our relations, because we're so interconnected to this earth, and we're destroying it. Respect your elder at the lodge. That could be your own home, your apartment. My place, I live up on 10th Street, but uh, uh, same as Layla, so that's my lodge. Um, so respect your elder at the lodge and offer the tobacco. The challenges are tomorrow's world. The choice is another spirit walk. First wrote by me in um, 07. And um, I've always wanted to read something mine that I wrote. And, um, I think it sounded good. Um, I hope you're going to take something with you. I have the two more stories here that I wanted to read some of the actual abuses. And, um, but, but I guess we got 10 minutes. I thought I was running on Indian time, but that's a talk going on here. <laughs> but just, just, just to let you know, um, at, at my table, I was speaking to some people, and they, um, after the first uh, part right after when we had a break, I was talking to one of the ladies and asked her what she thought. And she gave some really positive feedback and that um, she could uh, come in to hear with an open mind. And that, that I think that's all anybody here has asked an open mind. Um, I've had to do a lot of healing to get past being in a room with just the white person. Because the ones that have been at that residential school, everyone is represented that. And then, um, I know Tammy here did a five day, uh, her sacred journey, and she taught me a lot in just a couple of words. And when I started to get negative, she said, New thoughts. And that helped me through a lot. And it was uh, all my life, I've been having nightmares about the abuse. Things like that. Uh, when I did that court hearing, I came home. And I've had one night beer since. And that's how strong and how long I waited to see those words in public. So when, when you see us on the streets and you see us begging, and you see us laying on the streets and sleeping on the streets, from what us and the rest of these people here today tell you, no that the after residential school put us here. Because um, the, the intergenerational, uh, me, the set that my, my kids, and there was, we had no tools then to work with. And now, for a, a, a good many, 18 years anyway, people are beginning to talk about the residential school. And we're getting those tools and we're getting help from school, help from families. I'm an elder at one of the programs here, and it, it does my heart good to see um, it's the Young Moms program, and um, it, it does my heart so damn good to see the healthy kids and the healthy moms and dads. I use the city bug, um, public system, I won't get in the back. Um, but um, I, I see families on there, or our native women and children with babies, and it, it's good to see both a mom and a dad. I never had done. Never had done. I was in my spiritual school. I knew I thought it all the news. Half the time I still don't know where I belong. My family are all in Nova Scotia. We're so split. We can and we will never get those two come together and ask them down. Um, and if we could go under a deep, deep psycho analyst, I don't think we'd ever come because that healing would take so long. And my family um, are living on a reserve where right across Canada is still, is still very dysfunctional. Um, I pray for, I pray, my Indian way, you know, Tammy has it's allergic to that word, but when I say pray, I mean to my creator. And I've been extremely lucky that I've become 
to uh, Vancouver Island and uh, got to know many different uh, nations who are kind of taking all of their teachings and used what would benefit me. And it's been powerful. And, and I was telling you, Grace gave me this when I was doing some speaking elsewhere on this. And Randy says, very down to the nasty stuff in the residential school. And Grace gave me the sentence, tear blank. And uh, I know I was so nervous speaking the first time. I even called it my pig pen. <laughs> well, I get from Snoopy. But I don't think it's pig pen. I still can't figure out what I'm doing to carry the blanket. But this, this is my comfort blanket. And, uh, when you see through that, you know that we need some comfort. This is a very powerful and good little mediator of me. Um, I thank you, honestly, for you all being here. We've got new information and all the old data was stuff and the old well data that we can start with the one here today and go to the good of what are we doing. We are a community. chosen to be around people that want the best for me. And 
I know my mom does, but she's struggling herself. And um, I grew up in foster care and four different homes. And the one I remember the most is growing up on a farm for 18 months. And it was so beautiful. I had amazing foster parents, had a horse, and everything. But there, I was sexually abused for over a year by my foster mother, who was 15 years old. And I don't know if I ever resented him or anything, but I was thinking about it last week when I was asked to speak here. And my thought was, what ever harmed this young guy to abuse a five-year-old girl for that long? And I forgive him for that. And I forgive a lot of people for the harm they've caused me. Because without that, I wouldn't be here I'm learning how to love myself and create a life for me and my kids. You know, my kids are young, and I still have a chance to show them a beautiful life without isolation and all the abuse that I went through. When I was a child and a teenager, I just, I didn't have, yeah, I was having a hard time last week and I thought I didn't have a spiritual connection and I was like riding home and I was almost crying. And I lost the scooter keys to my brother's scooter and the alarm was going off all the way from downtown to Penn Street. <laughs> and all I could look at was the sunset and I wanted to stop and watch the sunset, but I couldn't because the stupid scooter went so far off. <laughs> and to me, that that shows that I am connected to my surroundings and I am understanding myself a little bit more and more. And even last week, I was talking with my drug and alcohol counselor and I told him I'm starting to listen to the good things that people say about me. I'm starting to listen, but I'm not accepting it yet. But it, you know, that's a step for me to be huge and to look at myself and see beauty in myself. Um, yeah, um, I don't really know. I don't say I'm, this is, yeah, I'm really grateful to be here. Um, Telecom that has helped me in so many ways that I can't even describe. They put up their hands to me so many times, and I'm so grateful for that because I wouldn't be here. They see so much potential in me that I have never seen, but I'm feeling it now. And this is where I'm supposed to be. And that I thank you so much for being here and supporting this workshop.
but unfortunately my best wasn't good enough for the Ministry of Children and Families. My mother didn't do a very good job of protecting me from my father when I was young. And so I promised Jason that I would protect him from getting shot by her hand. And unfortunately that included his father as well. The Ministry of Children and Families had been involved with me when I was youth. And because of me being a product of my environment, I was an unhealthy person. I had a low self-esteem. I, um, I used drugs and I drank and I made very unwise decisions. And I knew about these things and they used that prejudice against me when they took my son. And they ended up giving him to his father. And I, I went over my family plan with them, and I utilized all of my community resources that I possibly could. I went over family plan after family plan after family plan after family plan, after family plan. and I advocated for myself. as an individual. Unfortunately, I wasn't seen as an individual. I was seen as a statistic. Someone who came from a family that didn't care for her. Someone that was abandoned and someone that was abused. Jason's father had a family. They were wealthy. They were white. They were not known to the Ministry of Children and Families. Their history was not known to them. So Jason was placed with his father. And that was my greatest fear. And it happened. I did everything that I could to protect him. And by doing that, more and more time with my son was taken from me. And I didn't understand because I was doing everything that was asked of me.
because of Casey's father's drug addiction, and because of my distant relationship with Tony, I was forced to make the decision to adopt Tony to his grandparents so I could still pursue a relationship with him and still allow him to have a relationship with his brothers and sisters before he became a child of the system. When you're involved in the Ministry of Children and Families, you have a very short time period to get your children back. I was promised a 54.1, which is intended for people of Aboriginal descent who go through things like what I have been through, to allow them to have the opportunity to make those changes outside of that time and to be able to regain custody of their children. I'm still fighting for that 54.1, and I'm on the brink of not being able to have that with my son, and I have fought very hard. He's three and a half years old right now. Judged by my past and for the lack of wellness in my family and for the obvious um, prejudice against my race, I missed out on a lot of opportunities as a mother and I deserve those opportunities. Just like every other individual in this room, I deserve that opportunity to parent my children. I just needed the help. And had they maybe helped me when I was younger? And when I had approached the Ministry of Children and Families as a child who was being abused, maybe they could have stepped in and maybe they could have given me that help so that I wouldn't have pursued those relationships, so that maybe I wouldn't have become a product of my environment, so that maybe I could feel inspired to be something else, to realize that I do have work. Instead, they took that work away from me. They made me feel like nothing that I did was good enough that their accusations, they didn't have to prove, I didn't have an opportunity to prove them wrong. They wouldn't drug test me, they wouldn't allow, they, it was one thing after the other. After I had crossed everything off my list, bam, a whole other list for me that came out of nowhere. It had no reason to be there. And again, another list, another list, another list. They endangered my son by placing him with his father and it all came to light. Myself, my son's father, and my son were all drug tested. And after waiting for this moment for a really long time to be able to finally prove the wrong, my drug test came back clean. His father's didn't. And my son, who was three years old at the time, failed the drug test and tested positive for cocaine. I had fought really hard to keep him safe from this happening. And the Ministry of Children and Families, you're supposed to be able to trust them. And I lost faith in that system. But after fighting and persevering for so long, and with the help of Tilkumalem and everyone else in the community, that really made me feel like, you know what, you're doing the right thing. And even if your voice shakes, like the truth matters, I now have custody of my son Kaysen. I have him full time. And I have a beautiful little girl, and her name is Kiko, and she's six months old. And I have a close out ministry, and I'm now pursuing a degree in social work that I can hopefully be a part of the children team and help everybody else within the community with my struggles to keep families together and to not separate them, to treat everyone as an individual.
Babam Pustimo. Ait Kesiem, Ait Slaini, Ait Swetesiem. Ait Ate, Kuala Tansit, Ziem, Ziem. I'm going to use the language that was forced on my people. English. I'm going to use the language that was beaten and broken into my people. English. My name is Patrick Allen. My traditional name is Qualbison. I shared the name with my father, Patrick Alex Sr. I have a grandmother in the room, Florence James. Her sister is my grandma. I also grew up around her mother, Mary Jo. There's my great grandmother. My mother is Laura Lee James. She comes from Penelica. Like I said, my father is Patrick Alex Sr. He comes from Spanish First Nation. I want to thank all the speakers here today for sharing their story the importance of this story, our truth. And hold your head up high when you get those standing ovations, because you deserve it. You're worth it. Yes. Like the shame that was passed on my people, that was beat into my people, I thought I wasn't good enough. My grandfather, Ralph James, he went to residential school in Cooper Island. And he shared stories with me, only a little bit. Very little he shared with me. He said, son, you speak loud when you speak. Because there's elders in the room that can't hear you. I said, okay. <laughs> I want to thank all the elders that are here today. The self plan. This is my elders that encouraged me to do this kind of work. They say, if you want to do the work that we do, it starts with you. It starts inside yourself, your saline, your spirit. I was abandoned as a child as well. Even though I grew up around my parents, they weren't there. I didn't understand this was the result of residential school. I was so angry and resentful towards my parents before I knew the information that you saw today. I didn't understand why my parents were drinking every weekend. I didn't understand why, why I was getting left alone all the time. My sister raised me, my older sister. Her name's Kelly. And we, we struggled in poverty. We struggled to get food. I don't blame my parents for it anymore because I've done the healing to understand the stuff that we saw today. The shame that was passed on to me isn't mine. It's not mine. The trauma that was passed on to me was not mine. Yes, I have abandonment issues, but today I get to work on them. I get to do this kind of work, and I want to thank some of my mentors that helped me along my healing journey. Rod Jeffries and Wanda 
Father Gabriel. They helped me understand that I was full of shame, that I, I thought of myself not good enough, not deserving, not deserving of, of a good life. You see, I have a disability. It's called cerebral palsy. It just adds to, to the hurt. I'm not supposed to be walking in front of you right now. I'm not supposed to be talking in front of you not right now. I'm not supposed to be moving my hands in front of you right now, but I am.
How do we treat that little boy and little girl? Have we abandoned that little girl? Because those kids in the residential school, those little girls went through so much. I speak for those kids who didn't have a voice, whose bodies haven't been found yet. You know, I speak for my grandfather and my family and my ancestors. I have to be that voice for my people. But I need help. <laughs> Not a match, Kuala and Siyam, working as one. We say it, but we need to do it. Everybody can sit down now. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to thank Jotham Laylam, Hey Al, Pedro Corpez, all the staff of Jotham Laylam, where my where my journey began. They saw something in a man that he didn't see in himself. You know, I was broken, beaten. They gave me my first job with a day camp to build my self-esteem. And they didn't judge me. They just loved me. You know, life's going to knock us down. You know, it is. It's a cruel world. So I want you to try land on your back. Because when you can look up, you can get up. And fear, false evidence of fear and real. Okay? False evidence of fear and real. There's only two fears in life. Fear of a loud sound and the fear of falling. And the rest we create. Right? And there's nothing firmly in life but change. And how are we going to be a part of that change? Because we deserve change. Because we are vulnerable. Right? Right, right, right. My name is Paul Hussein, and I stand. I forgot one thing. I won't get you to stand. But what do you stand for? Why are you here? Tammy said it. We all have a gift. We all have something to offer. I want you to imagine yourself on your deathbed. Imagine yourself. And it's done. It's already gone. And the thing already went off. And all your dreams and your goals are standing around you. And one by one, they say, only you could have brought those gifts out. Only you could have wrote that book. Only you could have said that in your voice. Only you. Don't die with your gifts, people. You're here for a reason. We're all here for a reason. And I'm finding that reason one day at a time. Even sometimes I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has to. Right? And this is my story and I'm here. And this is my purpose. I don't want it to be sometimes. <laughs> but it is. So I want to thank you again, Philip O'Malley. This is what you've helped create. Thank you.